Good morning, I'm Sophia Kai. Welcome to the news briefing from the 251st National Meeting Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Gunda Georg and Jillian Kaiser from the University of Minnesota. They'll be talking to us about their work on a new birth control for men. Dr. Georg? All right. Um, <clears throat> so, um, for a long time now, uh, we have had uh, birth control uh, therapies for uh, women uh, that was developed in the 1960s, and those are hormonal approaches. And uh, at the time, uh, many people thought that the um, male contraceptive pill would be just on the heels of, of, the, of the, the, male, uh, the female um, pill. Um, and um, many studies have uh, been conducted in the clinic um, using testosterone as the agent, as it's a hormonal type of approach uh, as well. Um, so it has been in the clinic now for decades, but um, uh, uh, several uh, side effects such as um, uh, weight gain, acne, mood changes, and uh, the lowering of the good cholesterol levels in men have prevented this um, to come to the market. Now, researchers are still uh, trying to uh, change um, uh, the um, formulation and uh, to bring this to market. Uh, but it's been a long road and it hasn't really yielded um, the desired results. Uh, so a number of research groups, including ours, we are now supported by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development to develop non-hormonal treatments. And as I said, there are a number of groups working on uh, different uh, approaches. And one of the approaches that we're working on, and this is the uh, poster that we have presented here yesterday, is on retinoic acid receptor inhibitors. And now I'm going to ask Jill uh, to tell you a little bit more uh, about um, this particular approach, which we feel is very promising uh, because researchers before us have shown that um, uh, using this particular target, uh, it is highly effective. And uh, in the animals that ob uh, obtained these types of test drugs, um, um, they were um, uh, not showing any side effects. And uh, after discontinuing uh, uh, these compounds, uh, full uh, fertility uh, was regained. And so that's, I guess, so what, what we really need with uh, any contraceptive, but particularly also with the male contraceptive, is something that's highly effective, does not ha have any side effects, and that fertility can be resumed after discontinuation uh, of the drug. Okay, so Jill, maybe you tell uh, everybody a little more about uh, our particular work. Okay, so um, retinoic acid is a metabolite of vitamin A. Um, and there are three different retinoic acid receptors, alpha, beta, and gamma. And our group looks at RAR alpha. Um, knockout studies in mice where the mice have been had the RAR alpha removed, um, are completely healthy, they're just infertile. Um, and our collaborator, Deborah Volgamuth, has shown that uh, giving drugs that target RAR, uh, specifically RAR alpha, um, are completely healthy, they're just infertile, and when the drugs are removed, uh, they return to full fertility. Um, so Bristol-Myers Squibb had initially developed uh, a series of compounds um, that were both um, active against RAR, so there's a pan-antagonist as well as an alpha-selective antagonist. Both of these compounds are um, active against uh, spermatogenesis, so sperm development. Um, but when given uh, orally, only the pan-antagonist is um, active. And so for a male birth control pill, you would want something to be taken orally. You wouldn't, have, wouldn't want to have to give yourself a shot every day. Um, and so we've been working to make a drug that is um, that you could take orally, um, but is active only against RAR alpha in order to prevent any unintended side effects. 
Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you both. Okay. Uh, next, we'll move on to a few questions. Um, so please wait for the microphone to come to you and state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Thank you. This is Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Could you just say how far you have actually got towards making this RAR alpha without the side effects, um, an oral active version? What's the current status? Um, so we have made somewhere between um, 50 to 100 compounds in our lab that uh, were based on the Bristol-Myers Squibb scaffold. And uh, while we were able to uh, make the compounds um, that um, kind of switched out certain aspects of uh, the initial compounds um, in order to prevent any metabolism that we that could have been going on to prevent the drug from being active orally. Most of the changes that we made um, decreased the selectivity. And so about eight months ago, we switched from the BMS scaffold to a new scaffold um, and uh, that was developed by ESI. And but it was not developed for male contraception. The BMS compound and also the ESI compounds were uh, developed for other indications. And so, um, uh, in, in the case of the BMS compound, um, uh, this, is, um, I guess, was um, a side effect that they found that male sterility was, was the side effect. And actually, they uh, described it as testicular toxicity. And so the side effect is really, that's what we're capitalizing now on. Uh, you know, you find that often in drug discovery that you have a drug that has a certain type of activity and then there is a side effect that was not anticipated and then you can take that side effect and then use that for a new indication or take these kinds of compounds and make them even better uh, in targeted towards the new approach or the new therapeutic intervention that you are developing. What was the ESI compound used for? Um, I think Bristol-Myers developed these for uh, as anti-inflammatory compounds and for certain types of skin diseases. And so this has been in literature, you know, some years ago. And it was uh, our collaborator, as um, uh, Jill said, Deborah Wolgemuth at, uh, at Columbia University, who picked up on that and um, then uh, reported some of this data. And we are collaborating with her now. And if we develop some good compounds, um, she will then test those in, in animals. How long before you think you have a, identified a, a lead, lead compound that you could take forward into preclinical? What's the sort of time frame that you're looking at? That's, of course, always hard to say, but um, the results that we're reporting here, I think, are pointing into the right direction where we need to go. Um, so um, we have identified a specific position in the molecule where we can now make changes to hopefully improve uh, water solubility. And so I don't know whether the compound that we have right now is ready to go into animals, but it, it really shows us, you know, what, um, where we can make, implement those, those changes. And so if we want to be over-optimistic, I would say, <laughs> Jill, what do you think when you can <laughs> make uh, several more compounds in that series? Uh, it's, it should, I mean... If the chemistry goes well, you know, if the synthesis doesn't really take that long, you know, a couple weeks from start to finish, you can get a variety of compounds. Um, but of course, things always go wrong. So. <laughs> well, yeah, we also need to test them. So what we usually do once we have the compounds, we make sure uh, that you know the identity, purity, and so forth is established, and then we have an in vitro assay to uh, find out what the potency is and also what the selectivity is of the compound. And so far, the changes that Jill has made to the molecule uh, were um, such that uh, we retained quite good potency and excellent selectivity. And so, you know, we don't want to be overselling things, but this we feel it is sort of. I guess the best we have. Uh, after uh, you know, making many compounds, it seems we're on the right track now. How did you address the selectivity problem? And can you just explain what you mean by selectivity? Was this selectivity for different uh, retinoic acid receptors? Is that right? Point? Right. So um, 
We were basing the, so the new scaffold that we're working on is uh, from uh, ESI. And um, it's very, the initial compound is very selective for RAR alpha. Um, it doesn't show any activity against beta or, beta or gamma. And um, the changes that I made um, to the initial scaffold um, it did show that there was very little activity in beta or gamma, but had virtually the same activity against RAR alpha. Thank you. Uh, Bela Buslik, ACS Office of Public Affairs. Uh, quite a few years ago, there, there were many reports, in fact, they haven't exactly stopped, or gospel being one of the uh, most effective, uh, initially male sterilants, but uh, but eventually uh, uh, a reversible smirk pathogenesis inhibitor. Uh, uh, what what is uh, the group of compounds you're working on doing? Is it, is it uh, uh, an inhibitor spermatogenesis? And how reversible is it? Okay. Do you want to take that or should I? Uh, sure. So uh, the retinoic acid receptor is primarily involved in the development of the sperm from the more traditional circle cell shape to what you would imagine a, you know, a sperm looks like. So it halts the development process very early. Um, but then also um, it prevents the sperm from being released from the testis. Um, but our collaborators have shown that um, within a month of stopping uh, the drug um, in mice, the mice are back to being able to um, fertilize. And not only to fertilize, but also to have healthy offspring, which of course is an important issue in, in, in this as well. But it, so all, all your experiments were only involving uh, animals other than humans. Correct. We have uh, <clears throat> yeah, only animal uh, studies at this uh, point in time. I, and as I said, these were done by uh, Deborah Wolgemuth, our collaborator. So we were uh, not involved with those initial studies. But um, we, uh, I guess we published one paper together where we showed this difference um, in terms of uh, activity um, uh, for the two Bristol-Meyer squib compounds, the one that has the double bond and the other one that has the amide functional group, yeah. Uh -oh. And so Gossipol uh, is totally out of favor because it is too toxic. Well, I, I, you I know understand that, that but <laughs> I have a, a report from 2000 that, uh, that uh, talks about low doses of Gossipol, completely uh, reversible, uh, re reversible spermatogenesis. And, and uh, it sounds promising and, and uh, there are, uh, hundreds of papers since, uh, except that uh, they're all done on humans because, uh, because right. of course in China it's not too much of a problem uh, involving the entire army in the experiments, but uh, maybe perhaps a little milder nowadays, but back then, uh, and of course, you were volunteering. But any, anyway, so you think that uh, that this, this has much of a, a, a better potential uh, Potential. Yeah. Uh, how, what what dosages are you talking about? Now, yeah, <clears throat> really, when you um, um, have um, you know a contraceptive agent uh, or any kind of a drug, you're really looking for a very low dose. That's why you have to have um, you know a highly the compound has to be highly potent. You know, you, you don't want to take a huge pill. You know, you need to be. Um, in terms of um, activity at the nanomolar level, and uh, then you can expect that you would have, um, you know, sufficient activity at the receptor. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. That's all the time we have for questions right now, but um, maybe you'll be around for a little bit. Uh, the archived version of this session will be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live San Diego. And please join us for our next press conference today at 11, very soon, on an artificial nose to protect art from pollution. Thank you very much.